In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filled with smoke. Then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs, touched my mouth with it, and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And then I said, Here am I, send me. One of the suggested scriptures that I gave for this coming Sunday uh, comes from Isaiah 6 as I just read with you. In this scripture, we find um, a magnified view of God, and we find an, an appropriate uh, view of self on the part of the prophet Isaiah. And we also see Isaiah uh, commissioned and prepared and uh, properly uh, set on his way toward following or continuing to follow God's call for him. This is not the beginning of uh, Isaiah's prophetic work, uh, but we do see this as the starting point of a higher degree of his uh, work of prophecy, as he's already been engaged in it. But this uh, sets him up on a higher level with a deeper understanding of his purpose, uh, his call, and what he can anticipate in the future uh, as he sought to be obedient to God's call. Let's work through this uh, brief passage and uh, see what's in here for us uh, today. In the year of King Uzziah's death, this could have uh, been the literal death of Uzziah, or it could simply have been when he ceased to function as the king. Uh, he had disobeyed God. Uh, you can go back to Second Chronicles 26 and read this story. Ceasing to obey God, Uzziah had been stricken with leprosy, which of course made him uh, no longer able to be in the company of other people. And so the task of uh, being king or the kingly task fell to his son. And from that day forward until Uzziah's natural physical death, he no longer served as the king. Regardless of which way we interpret this, whether his physical death or his, as someone called it, his civil uh, death, the experience of Isaiah came at the time of some uncertainty, perhaps some uh, tumult in Isaiah's life, as well as in the life of the people of, of Israel. Uh, for um, Isaiah had been a very um, successful king in the way we would term human success. He had led the, the nation through a time of great prosperity and peace, uh, but he had not led the nation forward uh, morally and spiritually. He had not led the nation forward in their dependence and their faithfulness to God. So the coming of the end of his reign, again, whether it was his natural or his civil death, would have represented, at least for the prophet, 
and likely for many other people, this would have represented a time of great uncertainty. Uh, where are we going in the future? Obviously, anytime there's a change of leadership of a group of people, especially of a nation, uh, this is a time of unsettled sense on the part of the people. But into that uncertainty or unsettledness on his part came an experience uh, with God. Isaiah uh, doing his priestly duties uh, experienced God in a profound and likely for him in a very a new way. He saw God or he saw at the appearance, he saw the reality of God in his midst. I saw the Lord sitting on a throne. Uzziah, an earthly king, uh, his life and his work were important, significant to the prophet, significant to his people. But now Isaiah, regardless of how he was interacting or dealing with Uzziah's death, Isaiah is now seeing another king, uh, the true king of all, the king of the universe, the king over all, eternally the king. And so Isaiah's mind and eyes taken off of the immediate situation of the kingdom and even the immediate situation of his work in the kingdom. Isaiah sees, knows that he is seeing God in some form. He mentions the, the robes, the temple, the heavenly creatures, the seraphim, he does not mention the form of God himself. He simply knows that God is present because of how God is represented. The seraphim stood at God's beck and call. Uh, the English says stood above him, not in the sense of standing over him, but stood ready to serve immediately ready to serve. Uh, this term is nowhere else applied to, to the angels that attended to God. In fact, uh, the other appearance of this uh, term comes from the account in Numbers, uh, Numbers 21, when the Hebrew people uh, were displeased with God and God showed his displeasure with them by sending uh, fiery serpents. Uh, the serpents were poisonous and the, the inflammation from the poison or the inflammation from the serpent's bites uh, burned them. Uh, and so uh, they were the same term here. And so we get a sense of the uh, rapidity of these seraphim here. They were rapidly moving and they were instantaneously or instantly moving to attend to God in whatever God directed them to do. And so in God's service, uh, they may have moved as rapidly as we would think of a serpent moving. They're described with three sets of wings. Uh, two were uh, kept ready for instant flight in God's service. Uh, two covered their uh, faces they were unworthy to look on the holy God. And so uh, they, they had to kept, keep themselves from uh, looking upon the face of God or, or trying to uh, be too familiar uh, with God. And with two, they covered their feet. Uh, likely, this is euphemistic, uh, meaning that they covered the whole of the lower parts uh, of, their, of their body, which was a practice uh, usual in that part of the world in response to the monarchs of that day. It was a sign of reverence uh, to cover those things that would have been consider, considered less appropriate to be seen in public. But the seraphim were there attending to God, and they were also worshiping God and proclaiming God's holiness. One called out to another, the idea of them calling back and forth to each other, uh, almost choir-like, antiphonal, speaking back and forth to one another. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. 
um, never forget the holiness of God. We work against ourselves and certainly work against our understanding of God if we ever cease even momentarily uh, to remember God's holiness. There is no sin. There is no uh, imperfection. In fact, God is pure perfection uh, in the sense of spiritual holiness or in the sense of any other uh, sort of method of assessing thing, things. God is holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. We find this term uh, in Isaiah uh, at least 65 times. Uh, so obviously the prophet understood this about God. The prophet understood God as being over all, uh, over all armies, over all uh, nations, over any grouping that you could think of, uh, the host, the Lord of hosts. And God filled the place. Sometimes you may have heard it said, or perhaps even have said yourself, when someone comes into a room, that person fills up the room. Uh, that person's personality is so large or so outgoing that he or she fills the room, or that person's just their, uh, their presence. There's something about uh, those people that the room just suddenly seems to be too small for them. Uh, and often we say that in a very positive way, and here uh, the prophet is experiencing God in that way, that God filled the place, uh, his robe, the train of his robe, uh, which, of course, think about the pictures you've seen of ancient uh, kings or queens, uh, often pictured with a robe that extended far, far behind them. And this is the picture that Isaiah experienced of God. God filled the room, filled the place uh, here in the temple. He was, he was not able to be contained uh, by the temple because the whole earth is full of God's glory. Uh, the, the, the smoke in verse 3 um, the foundations of the thresholds trembled uh, at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filled with smoke, the, the glory of God, the Shekinah glory that we experience as smoke, sometimes as cloud, uh, all, obviously always something that would envelop the surroundings. In 1 Kings 8, the priest came out of the holy place a cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. So here Isaiah is experiencing the glory of God it's seen in this case described as smoke. God filled the place and God's holiness was evident. And appropriately, Isaiah responds to the presence of God. He responds to the holiness of God. He responds to comparing himself to God because in God's presence, immediately one is forced to look inward and compare oneself, hold oneself in the presence of God as if to hold up God and then momentarily hold up one's experience, one's vision, one's understanding of self. And in comparison, Isaiah quickly realized, I cannot stand in God's presence. I cannot uh, stand up in God's presence. Woe is me, I'm in trouble because I am a man of unclean lips people's words, their lips, represent their whole being. Isaiah realized he was a sinful being. He may not have gone into the temple that day thinking about his sinfulness. He may have been having a day where he thought things were going fairly well, and here he is serving in the temple. He's important. Uh, people look up to him, but in the presence of God, 
experiencing the presence of God. Isaiah knew how unholy he was. I am ruined. I cannot survive in the presence of the holy God. But it wasn't just him. He recognized that he was one like all the others around whom he lived. I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. There's that phrase again, Lord of hosts. My eyes have seen the King. I've experienced God's presence and that, and, and God's being, and that has allowed me, Isaiah is saying, to understand how I do not measure up to God, nor do any of the people around me measure up. Now, Isaiah is not doing this deflection or blame game saying, well, I'm not too bad. I'm at least better than those around me. That's not what he's saying at all. He's simply recognizing his spiritual lacking in the presence of God and understands that the people he represents or he was on priestly duty to represent the people to God. The people he represented, they were no, they were they were not worthy to be in God's presence uh, either. Uh, when we have a true vision of God and God's holiness, it makes us realize our own sinfulness, our own failure. Um, Job saw God, Job forty-two, and and repented. Uh, when uh, Peter experienced Christ's power, as is recorded in Luke 5, he cries out to Jesus, I am a, a sinful man. Saul, the rabbi, somewhat self-righteous, thinking that he would uh, clear out from the uh, Jewish people this, this rubbish of these uh, new Christ followers. Uh, he came to understand his own righteousness was, was garbage next to the glory of Christ. That's Acts chapter 9, Philippians chapter 3. When we have a true experience with the Lord, we don't come out of that experience proud, puffed up, arrogant. We come out with newfound humility realizing we are broken in the presence of God, for our sin has caused us to be broken. But it doesn't end there. Verse 6, one of the seraphim flew to me, Isaiah recalls, one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he'd taken from the altar with tongs. This is purification fire. It was the fire from the altar that represented the offerings being made to God. But in God's hands, this fire took on a purifying quality, a purifying role. The heavenly creature attending to God took this coal upon Isaiah's recognition of his sinfulness. He did not come with the coal prior to this. Confession. Self-awareness, self-acceptance or acceptance, uh, owning the responsibility for one's sin. These are all essential to prepare us for the, pur pur the purification that God offers us through the redeeming work of Jesus Christ. One of the seraphim flew to me with his burning coal. He had taken from the altar with tongs and he touched my mouth with it. Sounds painful. And certainly the purification that God brings into our lives can have a very power, a painful element to it as it burns away whatever impurities that are in our lives, in our minds, in our habits, in our thoughts. He touched my mouth with it and said, behold, this has touched your lips and your iniquity is taken away. This is this willful rebellion against God. Your sin is forgiven. Your willful rebellion against God, your sin, the, the times and the ways and the places that you've missed the goal of 
being godly. Your sin is forgiven. What's going on here for Isaiah? God is preparing him. Isaiah has already been uh, committed to the task of, of prophesying to the people and trying to get them to the next level or lead them to the next level spiritually. But there's another phase of ministry that God has in store for Isaiah. And prior to this experience, obviously, Isaiah was not prepared. Isaiah needed to realize that he had a lot of growth he needed to do. And the way God helped him grow was to reveal himself to Isaiah. And Isaiah humbled himself before God, acknowledged his sinfulness, and God responded. God was calling him to another phase of work, and God is preparing him for his preaching to the people would not be effective without clean lips. He could not preach to a sinful people unless he had confessed and been forgiven of his sins. And so now being called out and being prepared, Isaiah hears the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? At this point, it doesn't sound as if God is saying, Isaiah, you're the one. He's just putting out a need. He's putting out a desire for ministry. Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And Isaiah says, here I am. Send me. Would Isaiah have responded like that to God's question prior to this experience, prior to his confession, prior to his being cleansed? Likely not. God has prepared him. And now God is listening to Isaiah's commitment. And if we read the rest of the story, we know that God enlisted him for very important work. The call here is evidence of God's grace. God issued a challenge. Isaiah responded. The gracious God issued a challenge to an imperfect man, but equipped him with forgiveness so that he was in place to respond to what God wanted him to do. May you and I always be open to the appearance of God. Be prepared, though. It may not be pleasant. This was not a real pleasant experience for Isaiah. We, I picture this uh, a man trembling, shrinking back into the corner of the room, not real sure he wants to take all this in. But may we always be open to the appearance of God, even if it's not always pleasant. But if we follow Isaiah's conversation, and if we follow the conversation we have with the appearance of God, it may not be this dramatic, may simply be a revelation that we experience through a reading of Scripture when suddenly that Scripture uh, comes alive for us. We may have read it countless times before, but suddenly we see in it, oh, that's how I need to be applying it. That's how I need to be communicating. If we follow the conversation like Isaiah did, Likely we will have work to do when our interaction with God is over. Now, our work, if you continue reading here in chapter 6, full disclosure, our work, even if it's in response to a dramatic call by God, our work will not always be successful. Isaiah was told, preach, but they won't listen. Proclaim. They won't obey. His work was not always successful, but his work was always honored by God because though he might not have been declared or considered successful as many of our culture would define success, his work was always honored by God. And at the end of the day, that is truly what matters. 
that our work honors God. Our work is obedient to God. And if so, our work will be honored by God. I'm glad you joined me for this time of Bible study. I'm going to pause just a minute and I will put before us our prayer list and we'll spend the rest of our time uh, praying together. Let's pray for these people and situations that their names represent. Lord, we pray for Linda Gowan. We know that every day is a challenge for her in, in ways that most of us cannot appreciate uh, physically and emotionally as she deals with the physical pain. Lord, hold her up today and pray for David that he will continue to be the strength to her that he has been and we believe will continue to be. Lord, we pray for Grady Reinhardt as he and his family continue to grieve Sandra's passing. We pray for Oscar Brown. Any Laura West. We hold up Betty and Rodney Pruitt and Lynn Bagwell. Pray for Betty Edwards. Lord, we pray for the children, for Amber and Lily as they recover from surgery and broken bone, respectively. Pray for Jeremiah as he gives them attention. Pray for Gary Lytle and Grace Settle. Keith Dellinger, Russell and Hazel Dietz, Betty Reimer, Paige Herbst, and Rob Adams. Continue to pray for Frank Allen and Peter Miller and Joe Ballinger. Pray for Wayne and Kay Ballinger and Martha Giles and Randall Collins. Pray for Bill's continued recovery from surgery. Thank you that he's mobile and able to be back with us in worship. Bring complete healing to his body. Lord, we pray for those that are in nursing homes, for Ramona Settle and Emory Bishop, for Betty Campbell and Doris Wilkins, Bill Cothran. Pray for Duff Wells and Sid Plumley, for Albert Wolf and Marlene Bradley and Henry Whittingham. And Lord, for those that are dealing with the grief of, at the loss of a loved one, uh, we mention again the Reinhardt family. We hold up Angie Ayer's family as they grieve her mother's death and the Byron Barnwell family. Lord, we pray for others, for Linda Gowan's brother Chuck and continue with Tom to pray for his daughter Betsy and pray for Wanda Brady and Scarlett McGuire. Continue to pray for Wanda Bishop. Be with her as she goes through treatments. May they be effective and pray for Elizabeth Batesman, Jean France. Continue to pray for Susan Lavender and Edith Hughes, David Cochran. Pray for Brian Blaine and Jerry Langley and Helen Sander. We pray for Joe Fox and Martha Fox. Lord, you know all the situations that each of them is facing, and we pray that you will be close to them. And Lord, we pray for our church as a whole, that we may continue to know uh, your presence and your power work in us. Lord, we pray as we gather to worship, especially Sunday as we worship around the table to share the Lord's Supper. We pray, Lord, that we truly will be united in you. Not that we look for uniformity or a complete uh, sameness in each other, but we pray for true unity in you. Uh, as we eat from the one loaf, and may we know that it is you that unites us. And may we expend all the energy we need to maintain that unity in you. Lord, we pray that, that our worship not only will honor you, uh, but that it will allow us to uh, grow closer to you and um, 
closer in our understanding of you and who you are. Lord, we pray these things looking to you for the guidance we need to be the church that you want us to be. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining with me. Uh, I look forward uh, to seeing you in worship uh, this coming Sunday.